Lord, we are thankful tonight that you are still the living God, that you have moved, that you have chosen to bless us, that you call us your children for the sake of your Son who gave himself for us. You have redeemed us, and you have made us your people. We're so thankful for who you are tonight. We offer you this praise and this worship. You are holy, and you are worthy. You are holy, and you are worthy. We lift you up tonight, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Go with me to Revelation chapter 8 this evening. Revelation chapter 8. Now, what's funny is, um, out of all the, the questions and conversations that I've had with people recently about the book of Revelation, this is a chapter that I've received the most questions about, and it's actually about one specific verse. Uh, by the way, if you do have questions or comments or you want to make sure that I cover something that you're interested in or um, look into a specific question, let me know. You can either talk to me or send me a message later and let me know. I'll look into it and do my best to include it in. Um, but tonight, we will see in the very first verse one of the most curious things in all of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And tonight, I want to reveal or share with you what the Lord has revealed to me this week as I spent a lot of time studying and digging into this specifically and how the Lord connected it all together for me. Revelation chapter 8, let's begin in verse 1. We'll read a few verses and then we'll begin to dig in together. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to guide us into what is a difficult and deep subject. Open our minds. Let us receive from you what you are revealing to us tonight. Do a work in us that changes us forever. Do not let us leave this place the same as we came in. This is our heartfelt prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So one of the most curious things that you can find in all of Scripture is the silence in heaven for 30 minutes, for half an hour. Now, I've often wondered whether that's 30 earth minutes or 30 heaven minutes. We'll have to wait and see. But the scripture doesn't tell us that. I, I, by the way, I did do the math on a day in the Lord's a thousand years and a thousand years of a day. It comes out to 20 years if, you, if it works out that way, by the way. So I'm not sure if that's, that doesn't seem to fit with anything. So I don't think that's the, the meaning there. But we'll see in just a minute. There is a pause and silence in heaven. Let, let's rewind a little bit to remind you where we are coming from. By the end of Revelation chapter 5, we see Jesus is revealed as both the lamb that was slain and the rightful king of kings, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has the authority and the right to take ownership and redemption of the earth and the people that he gave his life for. So chapter 5 closes and we see the Lord holding in his hand the scroll the one who, that is essentially the title deed of all of creation, and it is enclosed with seven seals. By the, in the opening of those seals and the opening of the scroll, we will see and have seen that Jesus is bringing redemption to his creation. By the end of the book of the Revelation, the revelation of Christ given to the Apostle John, we will see that he has indeed not only redeemed his creation, but he wipes the slate clean and really does start again, starts fresh. But we are in the middle of really just beginning to get a taste of what it means for that process to unfold. So far, we have seen six seals open. Let's just go back over them briefly. The first seal opens and we see the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it is symbolic of the rise in power of the Antichrist. The second seal opens and global warfare spreads. The third seal is famine across the earth. And the fourth seal 
is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse and death is riding and hell follows with him. A fourth of the earth is killed at that event. Between the famines and the wars, a fourth of the earth dies and we are just at the beginning of the tribulation at that point. The fifth seal is probably the most powerful and the most dramatic and really is framing what even happens tonight because those first four seals are just the beginning, sort of the opening gambit. If you ever played chess, those first couple of moves, you're really not doing anything yet. You're just setting up all the pieces in the right place. Yeah. That's what the first four seals are. All the pieces get into the right place. And the fifth seal opens, and the martyrs that have been killed on earth for their faith in Christ cry out to God the Father, How long, O Lord, will you wait before you avenge us? Before you take your wrath out on the people that have murdered your children. And he answers them, come and rest. Wait a little while longer. There are more martyrs that will come. And then I will avenge you. So the sixth seal is broken. And we see the first taste of the wrath of God. The greatest earthquake in the history of mankind. It brings cities to the ground. In fact, the, the smoke, the dust, the ash rises so high that the sun and the moon and the stars are blacked out for a time. And that's where we ended last week. The sixth seal has been broken. And now, Revelation chapter 8 begins with the seventh seal. The final seal on the scroll is opened. And what we see is that final seal causes a silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I believe, by the way, that the seventh seal opening also includes the seven trumpets that we were about to discuss in a few minutes. That the seven trumpets are enclosed within the seventh seal. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. There is a pause in heaven. We ended last week, actually. I said with the, the sixth seal, but that's not the case. Last week we ended... By, we took a look first at the 144,000 on the earth that had the, the uh, had been sealed by the Lord to protection on the earth. And then we looked at the great multitude that were in heaven. And so we ended last week with the great multitude in heaven, which is us, worshiping the Lord. And so there is all of the redeemed of the earth, the faithful from all time, have been raptured to the Lord. Many of the martyrs during the tribulation time have already come home. We are somewhere in the middle of the tribulation now. We can't tell quite exactly where we are by this point. Some people believe the seventh seal marks the exact middle of the tribulation. That may well be. But at that point, there is just an uproar in heaven because all the redeemed are crying out, worthy is the Lamb. And not to be outdone, they are joined by the four creatures, the 24 elders, and all of the angels. There are so many of us that it says there is an uncountable host in heaven worshiping. And then imagine the drama of the moment. Christ steps forward holding his scroll and he breaks the last seal. And I believe this pause... One of the reasons for this silence is because we all just stop and take a deep breath. This is the last scroll. This is the last seal on a scroll. This is the last thing stopping him from completing his redemption. The last thing stopping him, the next step before he takes his rightful place as the king of kings on the earth. We are watching what is about to happen, expecting this to be the moment just before the wedding feast of the Lamb, just before he comes back to set foot on the earth again. But what we see, and we pause for 30 minutes to watch, we see in heaven, all of the redeemed, all the faithful from all time, the church is completely at peace. On the earth, the only people left alive are completely in rebellion. And so in heaven, there is silence because we were at peace. On the earth, there is silence because they don't want to talk to God anymore. There's nothing left to say. Let's hide under the mountains. That's where we left them last time. 
The last time we see the people on the earth, they're hiding out of the mountains, begging the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and hide them from God. Very soon, by the way, they will be crying out for a different reason. Kill me already. I want it to be over with. That comes in the next chapter. So there is silence in heaven. The world is in denial. The church is at peace. There is a deep inhale. Something big is about to happen. A great silence. We're seeing something is about to happen. He's about to go and pick up all the prayers. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And there is silence in that moment. This week, as I studied this silence, I found several things, actually. I had to eliminate a lot of it, or else we would have been here for three hours, talking about this moment of silence. But I want to show you from the Old Testament some of the things that it says about the silence, and then I want to reveal to you or share with you what the Lord has revealed to me. In Zechariah 2.13, the Lord is speaking to his people. He says, he's speaking to the entire world. He says, be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. In Psalm 46.10, he speaks to us and he says, be still and know that I'm God. Everybody knows that first half of the verse. Do you know what the rest of the verse says? The Lord says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. That's how that verse finishes. But that's not what I want to show you this week that the Lord has revealed to me about this silence. I want to remind you of an event that is often spoken of in the Old Testament and only hinted at in the New Testament. And it is called the Day of the Lord. Have you heard of that before? In Zephaniah chapter 1, it is speaking about the Day of the Lord and it says this, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the Day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. Who is his sacrifice? Christ. And he has invited his guests. Who are his guests? Us. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. What does that sound like to you? A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither shall their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them out of the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. I believe... Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. There is a 30-minute silence in heaven because the day of the Lord has just begun. Now, I don't know when we talk about the day of the Lord. I can't tell you if this is a single day or if this is a time period during the tribulation. But as we read the rest of this chapter, we're going to see it sounds to me like it all unfolds pretty quickly. And so I'm almost leaning towards this is a single day on the earth. And as Christ warned them, the day of repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The day of the Lord is coming. This is the day that the, the earth has been warned about. This is the day that when he told us, you've got to get right before it's too late. When he told Israel, follow me because a day is coming where I will bring my wrath and pour out my judgment. Back in Revelation chapter 8, it continues in verse 2 and says, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. So the seventh seal that's open is this silence, which I believe is the opening of the day of the Lord, and it's the passing out of the trumpets. Verse 3, now we're in the middle of the silence, and this is happening. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense, to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the Lord. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before, uh, before, the, uh, before God sorry, from the hand of the angel. Now in the Old Testament, within the tabernacle and the temple, there is a separate specific altar called the altar of incense. This is not a, pray, a place where you repent of sin. This is a place where you come and offer yourself and offer your adoration 
to the Lord. It's when you are asking God to do something on your behalf, when you're asking God to help, this is the place you come from, the place you come to, the altar of incense. And from that time in the Old Testament, with the discussion and the, uh, uh, the addition of incense into the worship, incense and this censer are always connected to the prayers of God's people. And so we see here, upon this specific altar, these prayers are offered as sacrifice before the Lord. And this angel adds incense as the final approval or the final stamp as the prayers are passed before the Lord. What's interesting at this point, though, is the church has already been raptured. In fact, we've probably been in heaven for years, earth years, by this point. What's happening on earth is the beginning of the wrath and the judgment being poured out. The Antichrist is in full swing by this point. There are already wars taking place on the earth. The Antichrist um, is still probably in the beginning time when he's friendly with Israel. We're going to see him switch and, and attack Israel later. All that unfolds over time. And we're looking from heaven and we see all of these prayers that are left. At this point in time, the only unanswered prayers in heaven will be prayers for vengeance. Think about it. Christ has already answer, answered all of our prayers. Everything that you were asking him to work on your behalf has been worked. You're in his presence in glory for eternity. Everything, all the healing that you prayed for is complete. All the people that you asked him to reach have either been brought home or they have been turned loose according to their own rebellion. At this point, the only unanswered prayers are prayers for vengeance. When you have been done wrong and you pray for the Lord to handle it so that you can release it. When those that were martyred cried out for vengeance. When, the, when God's people lived rightly before the Lord and trusted him to make it right in the end. All that's left is for God to avenge his people. And so that's why the angel takes the prayers first and pours them out on the altar of incense before the Lord. And then immediately takes that exact same censer. The censer is the big bowl that holds the incense. You've seen the priests swing it. Uh, you've seen that in the, the incense, the smoke is pouring out. That's what we're talking about. He immediately put, takes coals, burning coals from that altar, puts them in the incense and slings them onto the earth. In one moment, the prayers of the saints offered before the Lord as a loving sacrifice in the very next breath, the wrath of God poured out against the earth. The two must be connected. Verse five, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And in one second, these are holy prayers offered in sacrifice. And the next second, it's holy judgment from a just God. Our God is equally a God of mercy and a God of wrath. Yes. That's what a lot of people don't seem to get right about the real God. The Jesus of the Bible is just as likely to lift you out of the dirt and clean you off as he is to flip over the tables in the marketplace. The true living God is just as likely to bring wrath and judgment on people that have rejected his son as the sacrifice as he is in this day to offer mercy and grace to anyone who is willing to call on his name. He is mercy, mercy and he is wrath equally. On that day, mercy is complete. And so a God of wrath pours out what the people of the earth have deserved. This is that moment. I often think back to the Garden of Eden. They, pick, they take the first bite. You realize in that exact moment, they, they should have been struck by light. They should have been snuffed out right there. Their lungs should have ceased to operate. But from that moment, God was operating in mercy, looking forward in grace to what he would complete through Christ. But Christ is on his throne in his place, and the people that have chosen Christ have come home to be with him forever. And so the God of wrath is pouring out what Adam and Eve deserved thousands of years ago. Verse 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets 
prepared to blow them. We have now been in silence for 30 minutes. Not a word has been spoken as the angel offered our prayers lovingly to the God who sits on his throne and then poured out the wrath from that same altar upon the earth. And now they have been given, these specific seven angels have been given their trumpets and they prepare to blow them. I don't know if any of you have played a trumpet or ever been in a band, but the preparation for playing a trumpet is you have to take a deep breath and put the trumpet to your mouth. Ready to blow. Oh man, I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see it. In the visions of the Old and New Testament, the trumpet is always a symbol of intervention by God into history. We can look back and find all the trumpets. Man, there are a lot of trumpets in the Bible. I've looked at too many this week. Um, and we see that when God is interacting or using a trumpet, he is intervening in the life of men. We see them, one of the earliest accounts and probably the most important, happens at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. Uh, on the morning of the third day, it says, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on a mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. That's happening at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. The trumpet is a warning from glory. God is here. After that moment, God adds many festivals. We talked about some of those before. One of those is the Festival of Trumpets. Now remember, the Festival of the Passover is when the lamb was, was killed and their blood was spread over the doorway. Remember that? It's symbolic of Christ, the lamb who was slain. The, the feast, the Festival of First Fruits, is symbolic of Christ rising from the dead three days later. He is the firstborn from among the dead. The next festival we've talked about before is Pentecost. Pentecost, of course, is the day of Pentecost, which comes uh, thousands of years later, is when the Holy Spirit came to the earth and, and filled the believers in Christ. A later festival is a, the Festival of Trumpets. It is at the same time, looking back to Mount Sinai, when God established, declared himself with the trumpet and established the covenant with them, and it's looking forward to the trumpets of the end time. Let me give you just a taste of some of those trumpets. Isaiah 27 says, In that day, the great trumpet will be blown, and it will summon back the exiles from every land. Joel 2 says, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Zephaniah 1 says, That day will be a day of trumpet and alarm. Zechariah 9 says, The Lord will blow the trumpet and will go out with the whirlwind. In the New Testament, there are trumpets as well. 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself will defend from, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In Matthew 24, it's Christ himself speaking in verses 30 and 31. He says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a sound of, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, in case that's confusing, that is multiple trumpets at multiple times, but all within these last days. There are trumpets that bring us home. There are trumpets that say, he's coming back. There are trumpets that say, wrath is about to get poured out. It's too late. So a trumpet in scripture can sound an alarm. It can say, wake up, the enemy is coming. A trumpet in scripture can be fanfare that announces that royalty has arrived. 
and a trumpet will sound as he descends to take his rightful place as king. And by the way, destroy his enemies forever. A trumpet can also be a summons to a battle. God is always summoning us, calling to us, choose your side. This is the day of the Lord. The trumpets are about to sound. Isaiah 13, 6 says, well, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah 13, 9 says, behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. Isaiah 34, 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Jeremiah 46, 10, for this is the day the Lord of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. Joel 1, 15, alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Obadiah 1, 15, I threw him in because we don't know. Talk about Obadiah very much. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. This is the day of the Lord. When those who have come into faith with Christ, those that have chosen to fall under the rightful king, have taken their safe place at his side, and God will now pour out justice. You're safe. For them, it's too late. Look back in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. We're only going to look at four trumpets tonight, so don't get worried. <laughs> they happen fast. This is why I say this is one single day, because it happens so fast. Verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hell and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And the third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Notice, the first trumpet is fire, hail, mixed with blood, thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth is destroyed, it burned away. Verse 8. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You can see how these are related events happening all on top of each other. Because first it was the earth, now it is the sea. What's described as a great mountain might be a meteor, or it might be the explosion of a volcano. This is happening in the ocean. The salt water from around the earth is now consumed by fire and turns to blood. Verse 10. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. This sounds probably like a meteor or a volcano as well. And it fell on the earth, a third of the rivers, and on the springs of water. Notice that what the second trumpet was salt water. This is now fresh water. Verse 11. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters become Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. So wormwood is a type of herb or a plant. It's very bitter. It can be medicinal. But the word wormwood here is equally bitter um, and probably refers to something that is poisonous. Notice it is not death because they stopped drinking the water because of its bitterness. It's death because they drank the water and were killed by it. So there is something poisonous now about the fresh water on the earth. In Jeremiah 9, 14 and 15, the prophet is speaking to the people, and, he, and the Lord says through the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, I will feed them, this people, wormwood, and I will give them water of gall to drink. He, it, um, this is a judgment that he specifically pours out on Israel because of their idolatry. idolatry. He's specifically speaking to the prophets of Baal. He's specifically people, speaking to the people that have taken up all the gods other than the true God. And he says, your payment for your idolatry is wormwood and bitter water. In verse 12, the fourth angel blows his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened. And a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. So this is now, remember the first trumpet was the earth. A third 
burned away. The second trumpet were the seas and the oceans, a third destroyed, and the animals within, the creatures within them, and the third of the ships were destroyed. There's some kind of natural disaster that's not only killing the life within the sea, but also all the ships within the, within the oceans. The third trumpet is in fresh water that become bitter and poisonous to drink. The fourth trumpet is now happening in space. Something either in the atmosphere or in, in space around us has happened to the sun. I'm wondering now, I'm, I'm not this level of scientist or theologian, but here's what I'm beginning to wonder. By this point, so many things that could be meteors have hit the earth that I wonder if the earth has been thrown out of place or off its axis or is spinning in a different way. And the reason I say this is, but what if a third of the sun being, or a third of the day uh, being taken away means that we no longer have a 24 hour day because the earth is moving differently than it has always moved or it's wobbling in some crazy way. That, that may not be it entirely. There has been so much destruction, a giant volcano eruption could have blacked out the sun similar to the earthquake that happened earlier. That earthquake could have been the thing that triggered a giant volcano eruption or tsunamis or meteors falling from the sky. There are still global wars happening. These could be nuclear weapons. This could be some kind of future weapon. Um, you will find a lot of good theologians say all kinds of different things. The truth is we don't know. Something happens that destroys a third of the earth and a third of the oceans and a third of the fresh waters and a third of things in space are affected in some way so that our day and our life is completely changed. I don't know if you have noticed, you probably have, because I know that you're students of scripture, how close these resemble, how closely they resemble the plagues of Egypt. Right. Think back to Egypt, raining fire and hail, the darkness, water becoming blood, the fish dying, all these things that were, happened then and that will happen again at, on the day of the Lord. Is that, what's that? Things that man had no yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, you can see God doing things that must only be Him. It couldn't be anything but God, which is what, which was exactly the point in Egypt uh, during those plagues. Clearly, this has to be God because He starts it and He stops it according to His will. Mm -hmm. On the day of the Lord, He pours it all out: a third of the earth, a third of the oceans, a third of the fresh water, and then the light. Something in space is happening. Zephaniah 1.3 says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the idols along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. That's a description of the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, man, we love Joel chapter 2 as long as we're talking about the section from Acts chapter 2. But the rest of Joel chapter, chapter 2 is pretty dark. I don't know if you've ever read the whole thing before. He says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So I submit to you that Revelation chapter 8 and actually chapter 9 as well because we, we continue to see the trumpets blown there. We'll talk about them the, the next three next week. I submit to you that I believe this is the day of the Lord. A day of wrath and judgment that has never been seen. It has only been hinted at in scripture in the past. Verse 13. The Apostle John says, And I looked. And I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. Um, for those of you that are reading in your Bible right now, do any of your Bibles say an eagle? Yeah, okay. I, I wanted to mention that just in case. Um, the literal Greek word that's used there is eagle. Yeah, you see, an eagle, yeah. Uh, the ESV that I normally read out, the rest of this passage has been in the ESV, which is uh, my Bible that I normally use. But I, for that verse, I went back to the New King James to catch the word angel. Um, the literal word is eagle, but it's a reference to, probably a reference to how the angel is flying. 
and not a specific reference to the animal, but God has spoken through animals before. So there could be. So I, uh, yeah. Normally when we think about an angel flying, we're talking about him going up to heaven or down to the earth. This is an angel who seems to be circling in the sky above the earth. Because look at what he says. Saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So this angel is flying over the earth. The first four trumpets of sound, you, uh, you may be recognizing a pattern now. There was the first four seals that were broken and then we stopped to talk about how bad the last three seals would be. And now the first four trumpets have blown and we stopped to talk about how, the last, how bad the last three trumpets will be. It is escalating in its horror, really. It is escalating. And he cries out, flying over the earth, almost as if to say, you think that was bad. Wait till you see the next trumpet. It was the fifth seal that brought us to our knees. Our brothers and sisters who had been murdered, crying out. It is the fifth trumpet that will bring us to that place next week. Tonight we see the day of the Lord. God's wrath poured out against all those who reject Christ as Savior and King. Today you have the opportunity to come to salvation. Today you have the opportunity to choose Jesus, to fall in line where we belong. The only safe place is to be within the family of the Lord, within those who are faithful to Him. He is calling to all of us, to every person. Now, today is the day of salvation. Yeah. The reason he says that today is the day of salvation is because tomorrow is the day of the Lord. And that will be a day of wrath and horror. In the beginning of chapter 9, they will cry out, just kill us. But they will not be able to find death because God's not done with them yet. Right. Right. Wow, today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of grace and mercy. And the angel there on that day flies over the earth and says, woe unto you because of the next three trumpet sounds, the next three trumpet blasts. Today, though, today is the day of grace and mercy. A day when we as a church can remember that we have a great calling, a powerful commission, that we have not been planted here for our own comfort. In fact, it's not about us at all. It is about a king who went to a cross. It is about a savior who gave himself, not just for me, but for It is a call to a church. Wake up before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Not that it will be too late for you, but it will be too late for everybody who lives around us, everyone in our community, everyone that we can reach out to, everyone that we can say a prayer for, everyone that we can offer hope to, everyone that we can just give a smile when they're having a bad day at the grocery store. We must find the opportunity to interject Christ into every single moment. Today is a day of salvation. Coming soon is a day of wrath. What stands between this day and that day is a church that Christ has established and placed in the way. Remember, it's the church and the Holy Spirit within the church that holds the Antichrist back. Yes, amen. The church and the Holy Spirit within the church that keeps the great tribulation at bay. The church and the Holy Spirit within the church that keeps the day of the Lord as some distant day in the future that we talk about now. The church and the Holy Spirit within the church has to rise to the occasion. We are living in the last days. I believe it more every day. We are, we are living. I was praying earlier this week and I said, Lord, that my children have to grow up in this day. <laughs> I begged him, come now. Yeah. Yeah. Come so that they don't have to be teenagers in this world. 
Come so that they don't have to be 20-somethings in this world. Come so that they don't have to be out there in the world wandering far away from you. Come so that they don't have to be, you see, and it was in Charlotte in North Carolina. You may have seen this on the news. There's a man who is a street preacher in North Carolina. He got, he was a drug dealer, I think it said, in uh, in Charlotte. He got saved, and for the past six years, he's a street preacher. They are rioting in Charlotte, and there he is standing in the middle of one of the riot with a sign saying Jesus saves and the picture shows him covered in eggs and flour and silly string and everything they could find to throw at him and they, they took a picture of him and, uh, and the journalist asked him what are you going to do he said I'm going to wash my clothes and come back tomorrow that's the day we live in I felt unworthy to be a brother to that man Amen. we live in a day it hasn't made it to remain yet, but it's coming. And the church must be ready. Amen. Because when the day of persecution comes now to this church, we must keep in mind that they, there is the day of the Lord coming in the distance, far beyond when it will be too late to be a day of salvation. We beg for salvation for our family and our children and all those that we lift up, our neighbors and our friends, but today we must find a way to get there. Guess what? They're not going to come inside these walls. They're just not going to show up randomly. A church must decide to be intentional. A church has to decide. I would rather let this building burn to the ground if that's what it takes to get out there and find a way. This has been a crutch too long. I love this church. I love this building. I love the years that you put into this place. But if this holds us back, then God, tear it down. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes an idol. That's right. Yeah, church. Uh, we will always have church here. We will always worship together as a family. But we also have to find a way to get out there mm -hmm. as a family as well. Mm -hmm. And today, as we talk about the day of the Lord, the wrath of God poured out upon all those who have not chosen Christ, I want to remind you, today is still a day of salvation. But we are the ones commissioned to take that message of hope. Lord, give us eyes to see the harvest that you place before us. Give us a heart burden to reach them and enable our hands to do your work. This is our heartfelt prayer. Change us tonight. Do something in this church that helps us to reach the people, the community around us. Lord, do something that opens our eyes that awakens our community, that establishes Jesus Christ as the king of this nation. Lord, redeem the people that you have bought with your blood. Give them mercy one more time and give us the boldness to take your message with us wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.